Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's interview, uh, I'll be talking to Dan Trepanier from Articles of Style. Um, Dan was formerly known as the Style Progger or TSB Man. He first became well known because he became Esquire's best dressed man in 2009. He's originally from Canada, from Windsor, Ontario, a um, small town, and he came to Columbia University through basketball, and now he lives in LA. Um, Dan, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Raphael. <laughs> you look awesome, by the way. Oh, thank you. You too. Good, good style. And I can see a lot of garments here in the background. That's that's impressive. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm in my I'm in my workroom, so it's it's not the, the setup is not nearly as, as elegant as yours. You're you're outshining me on the backgrounds here. Oh well, you know when you work, I know how it is. It, it just depends on where you are right now. And thanks for making time during your workday. I, I appreciate it. Sure, thanks for having me. Your story is anything but unique. Just tell us a little more about how you became uh, this well-known person running Articles of Style. Obviously, there were a lot of turns along the way, and it's just interesting to learn more about that. It's hard to go back in time, you know. I mean, 2009, I had planned probably to, because after I graduated Columbia, and that was my junior year of college when I won that, that contest, um, yeah, it was a junior year, and then I was um, planning to go back to school. You know, I'm Canadian, and I didn't have uh, I didn't have a work visa at that time, so it was either go back to the farm or stay in New York if I went back to school. And um, I had been working with Michael Andrews and, and learning a lot from him, and, and wanted to continue to learn. So I went back to school and I went to the Fashion Institute. Um, so at that time, I was probably planning to go to the Fashion Institute and say like that's my next step because it's really the only way I can stay in the United States, and it was a passion that had already been. Um, you know, beginning wow. for me. Yeah, yes. exactly. So I wanted to learn how clothes were made, what the ins and outs were, and, and really, you know, if I was going to be in this arena and, and be as quote-unquote expert, then I really needed to know my stuff, and I wanted to be able to make suits from scratch and understand why one factory does one thing, another does another thing, and, and have a real, have a better knowledge of, of the industry, really. So I don't know about designer, but I knew I wanted to learn more about it at that time, you know? Okay. Okay. And that's that's great, you know, and sometimes I think we all have goals, and goals are important to drive us. At the same time, we will not always reach them, and sometimes we just have to take a different path that we imagined, and it may still work out to be great. So I think that's a good, good example of that, that you said, hey, I want to do this. But instead, you mentioned Michael Andrews. Um, Tell us the story of your first bespoke suit. Oh, that's a good one. Um, like I said, I, I went to Columbia and I did an internship on Wall Street um, the summer between junior and senior year. Now, that's the summer when you get a job. That's when you're supposed to get a good internship at, a, at one of these banks, one of these high-paying jobs, and then close the deal for your senior year so that once you graduate, you got a good job lined up. Well, exactly. it was 2008. It was 2008, and the banks were tanking, and I was an intern on this trading floor, and people were getting fired and crying and leaving every day. So <laughs> I kind of knew I wasn't going to get wasn't going to get that job, and I just started noticing tailoring more than ever because these guys wear really nice menswear. I mean, there's talk about a sea full of custom suits. Look at a look at a trading floor of, of young 30 year old guys making millions of dollars. Um, so I became enamored with this idea of, of a custom suit and getting something just for you. So that's uh, funny, like you, you were in this kind of trading environment, you know, and the purpose of internship, most people would say, oh yeah, learn about trading and your future job. But you were just more interested in the clothes, right? Which is just a good yeah, signal I like, mean, hey, I should do this. <laughs> I, I didn't even think about it that way. It's, it's funny you say that. I mean, I, you know, a senior banker would come over and give me a stack of papers I was supposed to study, and I was just looking at his, like, cuffs and his watch and being like, man, that, that guy is, you know, creating a story in my head about who that guy was, you know? And that's the real power of, of, of menswear and clothing, right? It's, it's transformational. It, gives, it tells a story to people. So I was so taken aback by the way these guys are putting themselves together that the banking stuff just was just going way over my head. So I actually, on that internship, met with a guy. His name's Chris Totman. He, he went to Columbia before me. Um, 
and he was one of the traders and he sat me down and had a very kind of real one-on-one conversation with me and it was a life-changing conversation he he okay. said uh he said why are you here you know why are you here I, I was the I was the kid wearing like I was already wearing Michael Andrews or no I was wearing eBay designer suits at that time in my internship um, on Wall Street so I stood out like people were like who is this guy way overdressing um, obviously way into fashion so he sat me down and said why you know it doesn't seem like you want to be a banker you should you should explore fashion um, we had a lot a couple long talks and he he told me all about all about the custom clothing industry. And he, he was the one who introduced me to Mike Landry's and said, listen, I, you know, I think you should go see this guy, Mike, he's doing something exciting. He's got an up and coming business. Um, and he's a, he's an ex lawyer who kind of fell into the business late in life and, and can probably help you, you know, understand a lot of it. So oh, that's, that's awesome advice though. I mean, that's great. You know, he saw you and, and saw that maybe this was more interesting to you and, and uh, yeah. presented you with this role model who also made the switch from something they, you know, were probably supposed to do to something they actually love to do. Yeah, exactly. That was sort of the, that, that was the lesson I learned on, on Wall Street was that, you know, I, I wasn't cut out for it. Um, and I, and I made a great relationship with someone that would be a mentor to me. So, um, then I had to go meet Mike, um, at that time. So after that internship or during that internship, I became obsessed with this idea, Raphael, of a custom suit. Like I needed, I'm a college kid, but I needed to have a custom suit. I needed the experience. I wanted to learn how it was done, all this, all that. So oh, I know I went, what you're talking about. It's like, you know, once you're at that certain level, right, you had nice brands, Keton and stuff, and you've seen them, you've got them from eBay, and then you kind of are enamored with this bespoke idea and, and yeah. how much better and, and perfect it is. I mean, little do you know that bespoke has its own downfalls, but you, you're just like so focused and think this is the holy grail, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the top of the food chain in the menswear world, so I, I just needed to experience it and learn more about it. So... Um, I ended up selling everything I had, all my Jordan sneakers, all my dress, Gucci dress shoes, all my designer clothes, everything I bought on eBay and in the thrift stores in New York or whatever, I sold it back on eBay. And uh, I, I had maybe 3,000 bucks, you know, which felt like a ton at the time. With that, I made an appointment at Michael Andrews, went in there um, to buy my first suit. And I had the longest appointment in, in company history. I was there for like six hours. So they, they bought me lunch. <laughs> they, they bought me lunch and they bought me dinner. And then we had drinks after that. All during my appointment where I was just asking a million questions. So, you know, wow, I was the most that's, that's customer service. Client. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's, that's called having a nightmare client too. Um, <laughs> so they were super nice to me and answered all my questions. And... Um, I ended up buying four suits that day, uh, which was way more than I, you know, I had budgeted for one, but you only put 50% deposit down on your first, when, you, when they measure you, when you first do your appointment. So I convinced Mike to let, let me give him, I don't know, 2,500 bucks, not quite the full 3,000, just for the first half deposit. I said, when I come back to my fittings, don't worry, I'll have the rest. So that didn't, that didn't quite work out that way. Um, eventually I came back 60 weeks later for my fittings and I didn't have the money. You know, I, I figured I would hustle and get some money, but it was the middle of basketball season. I didn't have any time for a job or anything oh, like that. So yeah. Okay. I, ended, I went into my clinch for my fittings. Suits were awesome. I was thrilled. Um, but I had to break to them. I don't, you know, I didn't, I don't, I don't have the money. So eventually I kind of went on a, a work release program and kind of helped Mike um, with the, with a million different things around the shop, just to sort of pay pay off my suits in that way. Um, and but this you, was the time. You didn't just walk away. That that's great. You know, sometimes we make mistakes, or we 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 assume you know we we can do something and we don't. But then we just say, hey, you know, how can I make it work? And that's a great way to do it. You just said, hey, can I, can I? Yeah, I think honestly, yeah. In those situations, I mean, Mike was is a great guy, and and we hit it off, and and I knew he was, you know, he. He, he fell for me. So I said, listen, I'll, I'll sweep the floors and I'll get lunch for the tailors and I'll prep the alterations and I'll write the tickets and, and whatever else you need me to do, you know? So I was, I was going to school for menswear design at the same time. So it was a perfect kind of combo learning the, the suit making while doing the whatever needed to get done at the suit shop. Um, eventually I moved into sales and helping 
clients with fabrics and design suits. And then eventually I moved into fitting and learned the measuring and the, and the pattern making. So, uh, but like I said, completely asked backwards. I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't exactly a plan. I just, I just was enamored with the idea and passionate about, um, the process and the old school tradition of, of tailoring. So I went in to learn more than anything and, and, and came out of it with a lot of things learned, but also an opportunity. You know, I think that's awesome. You, and you, you dig around, just learn clothing. You also learn sales and customer care, right? All these things. I mean, it's more than you kind of bargain for in your dreams in the beginning. Yeah. That, that's the beauty of joining a small team. I think, you know, I mean, Michael Andrews at that time was like four people, five people, and um, we did everything together. It was a shared responsibility, you know, whether it was answering the phone or meeting with clients or doing fittings. It's, it was really a, a, a business of that size. You can learn every side of it, you know. Okay. And how did you get into blogging with all of this? Uh, blogging was, uh, again, another hobby, very much a hobby. I was kind of the... Um, I, I played basketball in college, and I lived in a, in, a, in a house across the street from Columbia's campus on 114th between Broadway and Amsterdam. There's a fraternity row, they call it. They're all frat houses. Now, our basketball coach basically bought the frat house so that all of our team members could live together. It was okay. sort of a team-building idea, and, and that became our house. So um, we got very close to all my teammates, and I was – um, always sort of into fashion, even back then, again, buying stuff on eBay, doing online research, um, you know, you know how that goes. So I was sort of like the, the style guy on the basketball team. Oh yeah. And, and people uh, come up to you and ask you like, Hey, you know, does this work? Like, does this suit work? I did the same thing. I went, you know, to made to measure appointments with people to make sure they got the, the right thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, guys were looking for advice, you know, like I said, it was a product of good timing. Fashion was becoming more mainstream, especially for men. Um, and athletes, look at LeBron James and these guys, they started dressing better. So naturally, my teammates wanted to follow in, in those guys' footsteps. All the influencers and the entertainers were, were dressing well, are starting to care about fashion. So I became the guy for all those questions. You know, hey, uh, I, you know, we're going out on Saturday night. What should I wear? Can you help me pick out an outfit? Or I just got some money for my birthday. Can you help me come shopping? And, Eventually, I just said, guys, I, I can't come to like six of your rooms, you know, on a Saturday night here. I'm just going to write this stuff down. You know, I'm just going to start a blog and these simple tips that I'm giving you, I'm just going to write them down. You know, if you're if you're going here, wear this. If you're look, looking to shop for this, look out for this and this and this. And it was it was pretty simple at the time. At what time did it turn into a business? Um, it kind of turned into a business gradually over time. You know, our, our first, okay. our first sort of business was when we started selling ads. Um, that was when it first started to make money. Um, you know, I would get side things like uh, a little styling thing or uh, speaking at an event, very small payday, small gigs. But when we started to sell advertising, it seemed like something we could scale. So something I noticed or I was always wondering about is that you had a lot of um, rebrands. Like first you were a style blogger, TSP men, articles of style. What was the, the rationale behind that? Uh, we started as a style blogger, which uh, was a great URL um, and did really well for us with um, SEO and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I liked the name of Style Blogger for a long time. I thought it was it was it really nailed what we were doing. I think uh, our first rebrand was actually to get away from the word blogger. I think it became uh, what we were doing was not really blogging. Uh, we always had this vision of of doing something greater and getting into eventually the product space or at least the luxury branding space. And uh, blogger seemed very colloquial, very casual. I know. Tell, yeah. You know, and all the time feel, when you tell people, oh, you know, oh, what did you, oh, you're a blogger, and they think like you're someone who casually in their spare time writes about their outfit, which right. is not at all true. And on, on the one end, it's good because people don't see the potential in it, right? Which just mm. leaves more space for us. On the other hand, it's almost sometimes like disrespectful when people are like, so. What's your real job? And you tell them, well, this is what I do. And they look at you like, 
are you nuts? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is blogging, though. You know, I think uh, what we do is not blogging. You know, if you look at the vast majority of bloggers, it's 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 like an Instagram. It's a personal diary, um, and that's you know, yours is called Gentleman's Gazette. That's much more of a name of a newspaper. Right. Yes. Uh, and for us, we wanted to go articles of style because we're creating editorials and articles. Um, so the first rebrand was really that. It was really about um, telling people I run a blog and they say, oh, so do I. And so does my mom, you know, and, yeah. and it didn't really have, it didn't really explain what we were doing, especially from a photography uh, and editorial standpoint. And now with with products, it's it's we have that problem now. I mean, we, we we're in a we're in a very interesting place where we're, we're about to make a big shift again. Um, hopefully not another rebrand. We don't, we definitely don't need another one of those, but so no, it was the style. The style works, right? It's articles in terms of posts, articles in terms of items. I think it works well. Yeah. yeah I like the, the double entendre there. Um, so we, we went from the style blogger to TSB men to sort of get away from, from blogger. Um, and then TSB men, no one really knew what it, what it meant. And then it was back to the style blogger to explain it. Um, and then you couldn't say it on the phone. I was like, you know, yeah, I'm with TSB, I'm like, who? Like, what? TBS, who? Um, so that, that really didn't, didn't have that, that ring, you know. And then the most recent one with Articles of Style was mainly because now we have the product. Um, so blogger, TSB men doesn't work. Um, but we do articles, written articles, to your point, and we also do articles of clothing. So, um, you know, we're happy with that name. I think we're we're ready for a big shift again away from. Uh, well, we'll talk we'll talk about that later. But okay, all right, all right. So I mean, you know, you you mentioned advertising. We talked a little bit about it, but um, obviously you you don't like it in print, and you didn't want to do that yourself. But you know, having a team, right? It's not it's not free. You have to pay. You have to pay for your website. So you need to make money, and you came up with with products. You wanted to create your own product. Um, did you experience a backlash from people saying, "Hey, you know, now you're just going to talk about your own stuff, and you're totally you lose credibility"? Yeah, I think that that was a fear of ours early, and we, we definitely heard that. I mean, it's it's par for the course at this point. I mean, any people don't like change, you know. Um, anytime you make a, a big shift like that, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of backlash. I was personally concerned about it for exactly that reason. I mean, we threw that back and forth, whether having our own products makes us, um, inherently biased because now we're only talking, you know, we're only going to be talking about our products. We're not reviewing others. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about the user experience. You know, are you creating a better user experience and brand for someone? Or are you not? I mean, for to me, I, being able to participate and buy the products from someone who who's telling you how to wear them, showing you where they're made, full transparency, and, and being able to participate in an editorial is a more valuable customer experience or reader experience than not selling products but selling branded advertisements that you can't participate with that isn't your actual message, and it's just kind of this weird wash down message brought to you by such and such. So to answer your question, you're not really unbiased either way. Whether you're selling a product or you're selling an ad, you, you there, there's, a, there's an agenda there somewhere, right? So you might as well make it the original reason that you started, you know, trying to help guys, trying to, to advise them on building wardrobes and buying the right things. Why not just do that for them? How long was this time period from inception to actual offering? Well, we launched in October um, last year. We started our first like test clients, um, and we were developing for probably a year and a half before then. Um, it it took a while because what our process is unique. You know, we send every as a new client, we send you a basted fitting garment that's already custom made for you. So. There's a like the two sides of it is we have to get the proper information from the client to create the try on, but we also need the factory that can turn around the try on in 10 days or so. They ship direct to customer, then that's tied to our online fitting platform where you upload photos of yourself and answer questions. And then we send, you know, then we do the fitting digitally where we're reviewing these photos. So 
it's a pretty intensive process to Sounds just like start where you know um it's not something that can could be created overnight and it's something we're still refining there are still little things that that we can always be improving in just the the the, the startup process you know okay and what would you say in that entire process you know what were like the biggest challenges that you had to overcome ah uh, there's a lot <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot i mean first you have to have a workshop with incredible attention to detail i mean we're giving them up to one eighth of an inch increments and if they don't if they don't nail both the fitting garment and the final garment then our fitting process is out the window um, second was timing. I mean, guys, since we're doing an extra fitting for first clients, we needed to be able to turn that around fast. You know, guys don't want to wait too long for their garments. Um, I think a big step we still have to do is the user interface. I mean, that's something that right now drives me nuts. I mean, we're, we're working with a very basic startup version, kind of beta version of the, the actual technology we need mm -hmm. to do this properly. And that, I think, is probably the biggest area of growth. We're really nailing the manufacturing and the fitting process right now, but it's a little bit more cumbersome than it should be for the, for the front-end user. Um, so the development our, always takes longer and costs more, right? It's just... Always. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's constant, over-promised, and under-deliver. I mean, every time we go into one of these projects, it's let's have twice as much time and twice as much money than they quote us. And then let's expect to get, you know, three quarters of the features we're asking for. Um, so this whole time we've been bootstrapping this thing too, you know. I mean, we've been using the money we're making to build and taking very small friends and family investments this whole time. Um, so it's basically a shoestring budget up to today. And now we've proven the concept. That was kind of the hardest part was can you prove that people will buy this? Can you prove that you can actually do these um, fittings from people's homes? And, you know, a, a f bunch of other things. But we've proven the concept, and now we're bringing this to bigger players in this business and say, listen, we have something special here, but we need to build this the right way. It needs to be very innovative, very user-friendly. And right now it's a blog with this weird back end. Um, so... Again, it's it's a it's constant iteration, and it's time for us to spend some real money to make a a real digital product. You know, yeah, no, that's that's amazing, and it, you know that you can find people who, who believe in you too, because that's the hard part, right? If people give you money, they want to see results. Like they may like the idea of clothing, but at the end of the day, they want to see a return of their investment. And if you're at the point now where you can show that, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's that's the good news is we've we've proven that there's you know there's money to be made here, but also our clients are thrilled. You know that's in our pitch deck. A big part of it is look, we've tested this with uh, with a handful of guys, um, and they love their product. I mean, we get messages from guys that um, are are very you know have never had a such a great experience buying online. You know, and that's what we're pitching to our investors. Listen, this is a new we're solving the fitting problem of online. Um, and right now it's only for, for our own custom products, but this could be applied. There's no reason down the road we can't go, you know, we can't start producing casual wear as well. We already have the guy's entire measurement profile. Um, totally. So we, we want to become a sort of one-stop shop for, for all his menswear needs, you know? So, yeah, that you got to... It's kind of like sing for your supper time, you know? When you meet with investors, it's... They have some tough questions and you have to stand behind what you do and, and have the right answers, but it's a process, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a constant, a constant grind, man. You know, you mentioned the versatility of articles of style. I was curious to know if somebody would come to you and say, hey, Dan, I need a bare bones wardrobe. What would this wardrobe look like from articles of style? What pieces would it include? And uh, um, it would start with a dark suit, for sure. I mean, probably a navy or a charcoal gray suit um, and a white Oxford shirt. I mean, there, there are certain basics that, and we, of course, things we don't sell, like a straight leg pair of jeans or like a slim pair of raw jeans, um, penny loafers and cap toes. I mean, I'm not, 
I'm, people think I'm like really forward thinking on these things. You know, it's really classic American stuff. It's really just about the right ones okay. um, and the fit and the right fabric. So our starter package, I would say, would be a, a tailored dark suit, a white Oxford shirt, and a trim top coat. Um, and if that suits a three piece, you can already mix and match that that a, a little bit, you know. And that's we like to start guys slow and train them to say like, listen, you can don't just think of this as a suit. Think of it as a trouser, as a sport coat, as a layering piece. The top coat can be worn with or without the suit. So, I mean, the wardrobe can go as deep as the guy wants, but the key is just is curating it the right way so he's getting the most out of his purchases. I mean. For his for his kind of needs, okay. Yeah, That's it depends on the guy too, you know. So much of it is personal. You know, a lot of our clients, we have a client who who sells hose for a living, um, like garden like garden hose. You know, he, okay. he's not a guy to be wearing suits you know that's that's he's not a suit and tie guy but he bought a, a tweed suit that he can wear a million different ways so for him his capsule wardrobe is something very different than what a uh, wall street banker guy would would be so uh, to properly answer your question i think we have to take a step back and say well what are your goals i mean that's that's a service we provide is we get to know our clients say you know do you have an event coming up a wedding are you a suit and tie every day kind of guy what message are you trying to send? What's already in your closet that you like? Um, so again, it, it's a very personalized thing, I think. I know it's the same approach that we do. You know, when people ask about certain ties, I say, you know, what do you look like? What do you want to do? What's the surrounding? And then you can make a much better recommendation. And I think that's, exactly. that's provides better value to the customer. Oxford or Derby? Oxford. Okay. Flannel or worsted? hard to say this with palm trees outside with flannel okay um, necktie or bow tie necktie for sure no offense I love your bow tie <laughs> no that's totally fine um, belt or suspenders side adjusters very good undershirt or no undershirt no undershirt something you know that we get asked very often is about style mistakes what would you say is your pet peeve in terms of style mistakes? I think trying too hard, um, which is difficult because I think everyone goes through that, you know, myself included for sure. And there are many pictures of me online of, of that phase or those phases. But I think when guys first get into fashion, um, they want to wear this badge that tells people that they're into fashion, you know, um, and it, it, it can be a little too much. Um, you know, you see that a lot with like over accessorizing or too many patterns or, uh, I think, I think if you're not comfortable wearing something yet, you should probably wait till you get there. Um, you know, I always say like getting dressed is a skill, you know, and like, it's a very valuable skill in that it can, it can bring things your way that you can't predict, but like any other skill, you can get better at it. And the way you get better at it is just with practice. Uh, the, the more you practice and get people's feedback, the better you become. And, and usually, as you do it more and more, you, be, you, 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 you begin doing less. Um, so I always kind of, the E moment, the kind of E moment for me is kind of seeing a guy who's new to fashion, who's like really trying to let everyone know that he's really into, into quote-unquote fashion and is trying to do a little too much. What would you say is the best piece of advice that has ever been given to you? My, my, my mother always told me, don't do something that's going to cause you to look over your shoulder. Um, so I think the message there is to be honest and be upfront and, um, you know, not try, not try to hide things from people. That's, that's, a, that's a good approach. And then uh, last final question. Um, what would be a thing that, you know, most of your fans and readers would be surprised to learn about you? that um, I'd like to go back to the farm and live a much simpler life. <laughs> There's so much misconception. That's one of the things that bothers me too, right? There's so much misconception online. It's, it, I mean, we're in a position, we put ourselves out there, right? But it's, it's kind of on people to, to make of it what they wish. Um, so uh, hope, maybe it's that I'm, that I'm I, you know, a down-to-earth person. I think a lot of people think I'm like this guy who thinks his shit don't stink and like uh, he's, you know, whatever, whatever. 
when really I'm just trying to, to help people and create a good brand and, um, you yeah, know, I think you grew a, up in a small town, right? Are you just like you're not this stilted, arrogant guy? No, you're just a regular, normal yeah, guy. I think that who likes with it. Yeah, yeah, like you take pictures of yourself and you put them online, and you and you and you say that's good fashion. Obviously, you open yourself up to 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 a lot of ridicule, with a lot of assumption too. So, just that I'm kind of a regular guy and a, a small town guy, just just grinding, trying to build a brand, you know. Absolutely, and you know. Like I said, it's always easy to criticize, and when you do something, you will always have people who say, oh, this is bad, or this is not good, or how can you? But they're not the ones doing stuff, and so it's, you know, it's all a matter of perspective, I guess. And uh, yeah. what I can say, you know, what I can see as a colleague, you've done uh, great work, you know, your articles are in-depth, your photography is good, and I, I hope that this new system will really take off. And, and help bring more quality to to men in general and uh, more value and I can I can see it I can see the concept and now let's hope it it'll all work out well that the investors see it and I'm sure there will be struggles but at the end of the day I hope it'll work out thank you Rafael I, I appreciate that and thanks for having me too it, it was nice to uh, to answer some real questions oh yeah I, I think that's good and I hope our readers appreciate it too. And if you want to check out Dan's website, head over to Articles of Style here. It's definitely worth a read, and you should probably bookmark it.